My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Um, we are closing down our study of the relationship between the Great Tribulation and the Resurrection. Now, look, I, I, could, I could continue from the Gospels, from Acts onward. You know, Paul said in Acts chapter 14, 22, we, through must tri uh, we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom. Well, guess what? Great tribulation, resurrection kingdom. That is the eschatological narrative. Okay? And, and so, as I suggested, we could go through every single book of the New Testament, and that, that would just go on and on and on about the direct relationship between the tribulation and the resurrection. But I'm, gonna, I'm going to skip from the Olivet Discourse that I've focused on for a couple of videos now all the way to the book of Revelation to demonstrate for you that direct connection between the Great Tribulation, which Jesus in fact emphatically posited within the context of judgment on Jerusalem. And to demonstrate, the, I mean... That, that relationship, folks, between judgment on Jerusalem, tribulation, and resurrection is incredibly profound, incredibly important, but, of course, it's challenging because people historically want to relate the resurrection to the end of time. Well, the term end of time doesn't appear in the Bible at all. Now, look, if the concept is there, then we ought to teach it. But the concept is not there. It is the end of the age. It is the time of the end. It is never end of time. All right. In the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave to him to show to his servants the things which must, Greek word day, D-E-I, shortly come to pass. Now look, don't let people play word games with you and say, well, what this really honestly means is that, uh, you know, when it finally gets around to, to happening, it'll happen rapidly. That's nonsense. That's an abuse of the language. That explanation is only conjured up, is only offered because a person's presuppositional concept about the nature of the day of the Lord, the nature of the resurrection, is challenged by those time statements. The nature of an event is determined by the timing of the event. We must bring our concepts of the nature of things into conformity with what the Bible says about when those things would take place. Now watch this. Point number one, John was told that the Father that was revealing that the things that he would be given must shortly take place because the time, the appointed time, was at hand. Then John said, I, John, am both your brother and your companion in the tribulation. Now I want you to notice how he links tribulation and the kingdom. I'm your brother in the kingdom. I'm your brother in the tribulation. By the way, uh, in the Greek, the word tribulation has the definite article in front of it. It is the well-known, well-recognized tribulation that John has in mind. What tribulation might that be? Well, in chapter 7, John said he saw 144,000 saints wearing white robes, they were the 144,000 that were the righteous remnant out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And John asked, or John was asked, perhaps more appropriately, John was asked, who are these? And John said, oh, I don't know. He said, sir, you know. And so he said to me, the angel said to John, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. They serve Him 
day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. What is that dwelling among them? That's the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21, which comes at the time of the resurrection. Now, they are not yet there. As a matter of fact, the writer says, or the angel says, here in Revelation chapter 7, 17, the, the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and will lead them to the living fountains of water. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Where is that living waters? It's in the New Jerusalem, in the new creation, Revelation 21. After what? The resurrection. So here they are, the 144,000. They come out of the great tribulation. Now, by the way, folks, we have absolute proof that the tribulation was in the first century. Watch this. The 144,000 come out of the great tribulation. In Revelation 14, John sees this same group, this 144,000. Once again, the question is, who are they? And the answer is given, these are those who are the first fruit of those redeemed to God from man. The 144,000 were the very first Jewish converts to Christ. First fruits of those redeemed to God from man. How were they redeemed? Well, chapter 7 tells us, through the blood of the Lamb. So the 144,000 were the first fruit. That means they're the first. The first of the Jews to be converted to Christ. Uh, you know, James 1.18, of his own will, writing, uh, by the way, James is writing to the 12 tribes, of his own will begat he us by the word of God that we should be kind of first fruits unto him. First fruit, folks. So the very first fruits of Jewish Christians would go through the Great Tribulation. That proves categorically the Great Tribulation was in the first century. I'm sorry, there can be no other first fruit. It, these are not the 56th generation of fruit. They are not the 100th generation of, of fruit. They are the first fruit. And it is they who would get to enter in to the kingdom, to the resurrection, to the new creation. And when would that take place? Well, I will share with you when that new creation, when that blessing of the living waters, the tree of life, would be given. Obviously at the resurrection. Obviously at the kingdom. When would that be? Revelation is more than clear. And if you want to study on this, you need to get a copy of my book, Who is This Babylon?, in which I demonstrate, in which I explore the doctrine of the Great Tribulation, the 144,000, the Kingdom, and the Resurrection.